Well, hello everybody. My name is Louise Savage of Louise Savage Muses. Welcome to my channel. If you um, haven't visited before, welcome back if you have. Can you hear, I hope that's not too loud, the rustling of a book bag. Um, so you can see where I've been. <laughs> and in actual fact, I'm off there again um, shortly. So um, I live about a mile, a mile? No, I don't, that's rubbish. I live about an hour's drive just over an hour's drive away from um, Hay on Wye. Um, for those of you um, in other parts of the globe, you may not have come across the Hay Festival, but it's probably the most well-known literary festival, I would say, in um, the UK. Um, and Hay on Wye is very, very famous for its bookshops. So basically, you can't move a metre in Hay without tripping over a bookshop. It's the most amazing place. And it's one of those things, isn't it? When things are right on your doorstep, um, often you don't take full advantage of them, which is crazy. So it really sort of galls me to admit that this is the first year that I've been to the Hay Festival. Um, I've been to Hay before, but not to the actual festival. Um, and yeah, so I, I really didn't know what to expect when we went last weekend. Um, my, my excuse for going, of course, is the fact that my son Simon at Savage Reads um, has been doing some work for Sky TV there this time round. So he very kindly has invited me along to some of the recordings. So I've had a fantastic experience dipping in and out during the week. Um, Richard E. Grant, um, Barbara Kingsolver, uh, who I just, I mean, I've loved her books for years, so hearing a, an in-depth interview of her was brilliant. Um, and this afternoon I'm hopping back because uh, the inimitable Kate Moss is appearing and I really want to see what she's got to say this afternoon. So, yeah, I feel very, um, again, very blessed, really lucky to be doing these wonderful things. And, of course, you can't visit... Hay without visiting the festival bookshop um, and these bookshops amaze me I mean the staff they're so well organized and you know the minute a shelf becomes empty or a few books you know there's a book rush they seem to magically restock them uh, it's just a lovely way of, of folk um, what's the word I was looking for focusing oh highlighting that's the word I want um, all the wonderful books there are out there um, in contemporary in the contemporary world to read. Um, so that was a joy, and also a big shout out for the Oxfam Bookshop as well. Bookshop, bookshop. I can't get my words out today. Is it the sunshine? We've had really hot weather here for for um, June, and um, and I think maybe I'm a little bit addled by the sun. Um, that's my excuse anyway. So what have I got in my bag of books? What did I buy? Well, it's one of those things. I, I haven't looked at this since I um, bought it a few days ago. So I think I know what's in here, but there might be a few surprises. So first of all, I went to the Oxfam bookshop. So these were secondhand books. And um, what did I pick up? Actually, are they in here, the secondhand ones I bought? Oh, I know, I only bought one in the end. I bought one for my husband, which is no longer in here because he's reading it, and I can't even remember what it was now. Um, oh, it was a Charlie Brooker book. He loves the dark, uh, satirical humour of Charlie Brooker. And I bought this one. I mean, you know, what can you buy for £3 these days? Not an awful lot. Um, so this is um, Marika Cobalt, um, The Purveyor of Enchantment. And um, I would not have picked this book up, I can't lie. Um, because of the cover it's way too twee for me um, and um, and the only reason I picked it up is because I, I have read a couple of other of Marika Cobalt's books and absolutely loved them so I felt this was a steal. Um, it's a story about Clementine Hope, she's 30 something, she is newly divorced, what else does it tell me? Um, she lives in a small ha Hampshire town which is not far from uh, Wiltshire where I lived for many years, uh, teaching music, or oh, there's a link, teacher, and working on a collection of fairy tales left to her by her great aunt Elvira. But mostly she worries. Ooh. She worries about rising crime rate, she worries about dis disease and illness, about offending God, and in the rare moments when she's at peace with him, that's God, 
about upsetting the man in the carpet shop. <laughs> you see, that's the thing. Marika Cobalt, particularly her book Guppies for Tea, if you haven't read it, it just made, there are some scenes in that. I read it donkeys years ago and there are some scenes in that that I've just never, ever forgotten. Um, so I just know this is going to be a joy. It's the sort of book when you've got a spare day, if you ever have one in the summer holidays, and you want a, a sort of quick read to curl up with and feel really good about the world, this is exactly the kind of thing that you need to uh, get your chops into. So yeah, I, I um, it says it's wonderfully funny. That's Deborah McGack, um, McGack, McGack, um, who thought it was wonderfully funny. She wrote that wonderful book, Tulip Fever. Um, anyway, there we are. So that was my second hand purchase, or at least the one that I can show you. And then in here, I have an absolute delight of books. Um, so I picked up this. So I'm an absolute fan of Tracy Chevalier. Just look at that cover. I mean, I don't know what it is about eyes, um, but I think this is a really, really grabby book cover. Um, and it's called New Boy. And my feeling is it, it doesn't say so, but it, it feels to me like it's possibly written for with, with sort of adolescence in mind. I don't know. Um, but it's described as powerful and intriguing on the back and it looks really different to anything else that Tracy Chevalier has has written to my knowledge. Um, arriving at the four, his fourth school in six years, diplomat's son, Osei, knows he needs an ally if he is to survive his first day. Uh, so he's lucky to hit it off with Dee, the most popular girl in school, but one student can't stand to witness this budding relationship. So you can just feel the tension, can't you? Um, just from the, the, the blurb on the back. Um, by the end of the day, the school and its key players, teachers and pupils alike, will never be the same again. Looks like the novel might be set within um, one day alone, which again, I think is a, I, I like a bit of unity um, of structure, so that will be wonderful. It's described as magnificent, all sorts of people raving about it on the back. So yeah, really um, looking forward to reading that one. Sorry, my bag keeps rustling. Well, I don't know why I'm apologising. So what else did I pick up? Oh, so I picked up um, Hadley Freeman's Good Girls. I've heard her talking about this quite a lot. Um, and I do like to read nonfiction from time to time. I'm not as good at um, picking up nonfiction as um, I might be. Had Hadley Freeman, journalist, wrote for The Guardian for many years, uh, American background. She, um, she uh, experienced anorexia for most of her life. I think she's now in her 40s late 40s um so she's got children of her own and so on and um i've heard really good things about this she she explores her own um take on on her own experience of anorexia she looks at how um the treatment of it has changed over the years um but she says it's still you know she feels it's still very much a sort of rich kids rich girls disease um, and she wants to, or men, I shouldn't say disease, mental health issue. Um, and she wants to, to sort of, you know, expose that. And she wants to sort of try and change people's attitudes towards anorexia and help us to understand it better. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, anorexia is the, is the, is the big, is the number one killer of, um, young girls of any mental health disorder. So, you know, we ought to be taking it seriously and, and as a teacher of uh, teenagers it, it usually emerges when girls are, are in their um, early teens um, so you know I, I've got a kind of vested interest from the point of view of the, the children that I teach um, so yeah I'm really looking forward to this it's described as a story and study of anorexia and I know there's an awful lot of research that's gone into this book as well what else have I got in here Oh, yes. Now, this book I had never heard of. It's called Brother, Do You Love Me? And it's by Manny Co and Reuben Co. And the reason this grabbed my attention was because I opened and looked at the front papers and end papers. And that just fascinated me. It's like a timetable or a calendar. Um, jam on toast. Uh prawn pasta so it seems to be um lots of bridport places and what have you and i just that grabbed me straight away and i thought what what is it i couldn't quite work out because inside we've got there's a picture of narnia with the lamppost look 
Um, so there's lots of text, but there's also these quite crudely drawn, but, but really interesting. Oh, the lamppost has appeared again, look, later on. Um, images. And um, what can I tell you about this? So Reuben, aged 38, uh, was living in a home for adults with learning disabilities. He hadn't established an independent life in the care system and was still struggling to accept that he had Down syndrome. Depressed and in a fog of antidepressants, he hadn't spoken for over a year. The only way he expressed himself was by writing poems or drawing felt tip scenes from his favourite West End musicals and Hollywood films. Increasingly isolated, cut off from everyone and everything he loved, Reuben sent a text message, brother, do you love me? Um, when Manny received this desperate message from his youngest brother, he knew everything had to change. He immediately left his life in Spain and returned to England, moving Reuben out of the care home and into an old farm cottage in the countryside. So it's Reuben's illustrations and Manny's words, I think, from what I understand. Now, I don't know whether this is fact or fiction. Um, it doesn't, I must say somewhere, uh, because it, oh, well, there's a little bit about Manny and Reuben. Ah, oh, yeah, so here we go. I didn't get around to looking at this when I bought it because I just knew I wanted to read it anyway. So that is a photograph there of Manny and Reuben Co. So Manny Co grew up in Yorkshire and Berkshire and now lives in Dorset and Andalusia. He works as a walking guide in Spain and around the world. And then Reuben Co grew up in Berkshire. He completed a BTEC in drama and lived in Spain before moving to North Dorset. His art has been used by St Paul's Cathedral and his range of Christmas cards raised money for the NHS during the pandemic. So I suspect this will have been written from some, from the biographical details there. It suggests to me that, that there is a lot of truth um, in this story. And I wouldn't normally necessarily buy hardback books because they are expensive, but I think certain books, if you can, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm lucky enough to have the disposable income to do it. Um, but in this case, I really appreciated having a hardback copy of this book. Um, now, uh, I also bought this. So I mentioned earlier that, that Simon interviewed Richard E. Grant and um, this book is called A Pocket Full of Happiness and is a, a bestseller, contemporary bestseller. Um, and basically it tells the story of um, Richard's wife's and Richard's experience of her having um, cancer. Um, I think she only lived, I think she lived less, less than a year after her diagnosis. Um, and Richard is a lifelong diarist, so he's kept diaries all his life. Um, from what he said, he was quite reluctant to write this, but I think he's, he's you know, he, he sort of consulted his daughter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it has been brilliantly received. Um, so I'm very much looking, there's quite a lot of non-fiction in this bag, I've just realised. Very much looking forward to reading this. Um, as somebody who was widowed myself um, in my late 20s, it's a subject that still um, holds... A lot of interest for me because I think as a society we're absolutely rubbish and I'm talking about British society here um, at dealing with death at talking about death we keep it at arm's length or more than arm's length all the time and it just seems crazy to me when it's the one thing we can all guarantee I know that might sound gloomy but I don't think it is really um, so it's always really refreshing for me when somebody speaks with honesty about experiences like this um, and I think because he kept a diary through throughout her illness and decline. Um, I mean, I haven't read it yet, so I don't know, but certainly the extracts that he read out, they are incredibly honest. So, you know, he'll write with frustration about arguments they're having and and how he sort of puts his foot in it. And, you know, I think it's, I do get the feeling that, certainly having watched him talk about it, um, that this is a brutally honest, very brave, take on his own lived experience so again I'm really looking forward to reading this and then finally um, in preparation for um, seeing Kate Moss later I realised I think this is probably one of her most successful 
books and I realised I've never read it. So it's Kate Moss's The Taxidermist's Daughter. I don't know why I haven't because I think the t I just think for the title alone it's worth a read. Um, so yeah, so it says this is no place for the living. I mean, you know, who isn't intrigued? Um, it's Sussex. Uh, it's 1912. Villagers gather in the churchyard. Um, is it 1912? I haven't got my glasses on. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is 1912. Villagers gather in the churchyard uh, on the night when the ghosts of those who will not survive the coming year are thought to walk. Scary. And in the shadows, a woman lies murdered. Oh, wow. Why haven't I read this? I might start this this afternoon. I don't know. Um, as the floodwaters rise, a taxidermist daughter, Connie Gifford, finds herself marooned in a decaying mansion with her tormented father. Just sounds wonderful. Um, and I know, I know, again, oh yeah, a million other people have bought the book and read it, so why haven't I? Well, I don't know, I can't answer that. So anyway, um, I feel I had a most fantastic book haul um, in Hay. I'm feeling smug um, and I need to go and get my shoes on and get in my car and drive over there now um, to dip my toe back in. I think I'll be going back. I don't think this will be the only year when I um, venture to Hay. I really, really enjoyed it. Anyway, take care, everybody. Um, I hope you're all enjoying um, the June sunshine. Um, yeah, speak to you all soon. Bye.